This meeting is being recorded. Love those noises. All right, well, welcome everybody. My name is Jennifer White again with the Portage Park District and it's my distinct pleasure to um, have Becky Donaldson with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Scenic Rivers Program here to share with us about the amazing Upper Cuyahoga Scenic River um, that we have right here in our backyard in Portage County. And if you haven't had the chance to get out on the river or to explore, uh, it is one of my personal favorite paddling spots. And from the Portage Park District's perspective, the Red Fox Takeout is the last public takeout um, that's available on that stretch of river. So I'm so excited for Becky to be here. Um, we have known each other for just a while. It's hard to, <laughs> just a few years, Becky. Probably about 20 years now. Just about 20, which I don't know how po that's possible since we're both clearly like 29. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Becky, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much for being here to share your knowledge with us and all the little wonders that are along the river. Okay. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be with you this evening. And, uh, so first of all, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have a, um, well, I'm a native Northeastern Ohioan. I grew up in Northern Trumbull County um, on a, a small dairy farm right on Pima Tuning Creek. Um, I was involved in 4-H and Farm Bureau Youth and, you know, definitely grew up playing outside. And that's why I wanted to pursue um, natural resources as a career. Um, I have a Bachelor's of Science in Wildlife Biology from Colorado State University. I lived out west for about 10 years and then moved home to Ohio. And um, gosh, I really realized being in an arid state and coming back to Ohio, how awesome our water resources are here and how much wealth of uh, biodiversity that we have from our aquatic resources. So I've taken a kind of winding road um, career-wise. I, when I moved back to Ohio, I started working for Geauga Park District and then Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District. Had a kiddo, stayed at home, worked on contract a little bit for Cuyahoga Soil and Water. And um, then got a job with the Cleveland Museum of Natural History as a naturalist at Menor Marsh. So I've been doing that for the past uh, about 13 years now. Um, and just with Scenic Rivers in ODNR, uh, just uh, my anniversary is next Wednesday for my one year universe, uh, anniversary. So it's been fun here, um, learning the program, meeting lots of people and uh, trying to enjoy these treasures. And so I have just a little bit of knowledge of some of these treasures of the upper Cuyahoga River. So I look forward to meeting you guys all over the, um, in a hopefully a short future and um, maybe getting out and exploring some of these treasures with you. Um, so my official title is an ecological analyst and I oversee the stream quality monitoring program um, in Scenic Rivers. And Scenic Rivers falls under the Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. There's three chairs or three programs in DNAP, um, the preserves and uh, I work out at Eagle Creek State Nature Preserve um, here in Garrettsville. So I'm right around the corner probably from a lot of you. Um, Natural Heritage, they track the rare plants um, in the state is the second program and Scenic Rivers is the third program. So we're a pretty small um, division in ODNR and um, it's it's been nice knowing people across the state and I'm always a cheerleader for Northeastern Ohio. I think that our rivers are the best, but I guess I'm a little bit biased. Um, so Ohio Scenic Rivers Program actually um, boasts, uh, we got established in 1968, in February 1968, and not until December 1968 did the National uh, Scenic uh, Rivers, it was the National Wild and Scenic Rivers Program was established. So Ohio was a leader with that. Um, you know, at that point in time, we had some pretty big problems. Obviously, when I tell people that I work on um, on the upper Cuyahoga River, they say, what, you have a scenic river on the Cuyahoga? So it's fun to open their eyes to um, uh, these treasures on the upper Cuyahoga River. Um, but the Scenic Rivers Act um, 
basically was established to identify and preserve uh, representative vestiges of our vanishing wild and scenic and historic areas um, so that they could be protected so our grandkids can have the rivers like we see today or maybe better than what we see today. Um, it was amended in 1972 to include um, wild and recreation um, classifications as well. Um, but really, it's really neat that we were amongst the first to um, uh, be established in the whole United States. So I cover this upper um, northeast corner. I have all the Lake Erie tribes in northeast Ohio. So Conneaut Creek, Ashabula River, Grand River, uh, the upper Cuyahoga, and Chagrin Rivers. And um, I live in Lake County, so I am a huge Lake Erie advocate. Um, I don't live in the Grand River watershed. I live in the Arcola Creek watershed, which is a direct trip to tributary to um, Lake Erie, but I'm a stone's throw away from um, the Grand, the mighty Grand River. So the Grand River and Conneaut Creek in Northeast Ohio are considered wild and scenic. And um, I'll explain those uh, definitions here in a second. Um, but also really close by is Pima Tuning Creek and Little Beaver Creek. And you may have known um, Matthew Smith and Ryan Moss, who used to cover all seven of these rivers in Northeastern Ohio. So um, they split off and they're doing the east ones. So they actually covered the uh, Ohio River tributaries now. So that's how we split these areas. Um, what else was I gonna tell you guys on this slide? Uh, we do have five regions. So Central is home based right around uh, the Columbus area, um, Southwest and then Northwest as well. So what these different designations um, mean, the wild rivers are rivers that are generally inaccessible, like the Grand River, um, uh, almost canyon, you know, gorge for sure. Um, the floodplain is undeveloped, the river is free flowing, that means no dams, and 75% of the adjacent corridor is forested at least to a depth of at least 300 feet. So having that gorge protect it um, the Grand River, and then the Conneaut Creek also has that big gorge-like structure um, that has protected development from happening right on the floodplain. And then recreational is the third um, uh, type of designation. Uh, recreational rivers don't possess the same degree of natural qualities found in wild or scenic rivers, um, yet they do warrant protection because they have unique cultural and or important historical attributes. So um, Stillwater and Greenville Creek and the Maumee River are our um, recreational uh, rivers. So what um, makes a scenic river special? So this is the third one I explained the other two. A scenic river like the Upper Cuyahoga River that actually has this designation. Um, it's representative of a waterway that really has that the natural characters throughout the majority of the length of the designated area. Um, the areas along the shore are pretty much undeveloped. Um, if you've ever been on the Upper Cuyahoga River, you know that you go through some wild and woolly areas and then you come past some developed areas like through Hiram Rapids where you can see houses. Um, but pretty much the river uh, um, doesn't have too much disturbance or close um, uh, development. And also, so this adjacent riparian corridor, that, that corridor along um, the edges of the river must be forested at least to a minimum depth of 300 feet for at least 25% of the stream's length. And um, our beautiful Upper Cuyahoga River has all of these. So what are some of the other attributes that make uh, a scenic river special? So that riparian area. So that's that forested or vegetated area along the stream and the riverbanks. It is so vital for protecting our rivers and keeping them high quality. Um, it provides shade, the trees provide shade and having cool water keeps the oxygen in the water so we can have more aquatic animals live in the river itself. Uh, it slows down floodwaters, having those floodplains capture some of that floodwater, and it allows for some of that water to soak in. It also allows pollutants to fall out of that water column as well, especially sediment. Um, the banks aren't as eroded as eroded when you have good forested strips along the edge of, you know, a really good vegetated buffer along the edge of the river. And um, then it provides super habitat, whether it's um, the upland on the edges of the river itself, or even it provides so much in river habitat, whether it's root balls or the leaves falling in, which is the nutrient pulse of this um, aquatic system. Um, and then the biodiversity having an intact um, 
uh, forested buffer also means that, you know, so many different kinds of animals can live and plants can live up on the terrestrial area and then in the water because of the forest. Of course, it sure is scenic if we have trees along our waterways as well. And um, this allows for super recreational opportunities. So on the upper Cuyahoga River, uh, we have 25 miles that is, are dedicated. It was dedicated, you know, this when a dedication happens, it happens because um, local people realize constituents say, we've got a pretty special place and we wanna help protect it. So there was a movement um, uh, by some area folks who met, met at Kent State University and started doing some early on uh, studies and that allowed for the dedication to happen. So we have um, an area from about, from the Troy Burton Township line and it's still wild and woolly to the north of there as well. Um, in Geauga County, all the way to US Route 14 in Portage County, so pretty much to Lake Rockwell. Here's the um, map of on the right, that's the dedicated area, um, county line, and a good stretch into Portage County until um, we get to that uh, State Route 14. If we look at this um, upper Cuyahoga River watershed, um, it starts up at the head, the headwaters, the beginning of our um, Upper Cuyahoga watershed starts uh, pretty much in Chardon Township. Um, it flows down to Lake Rockwell. And um, this whole stretch, not the dedicated stretch, but the entire stretch is about 45, 42 river miles. And the watershed itself is about 207 square miles. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some cities in there too. So at the bottom end, uh, around here, We've got Aurora, Ravenna, and Streetsboro, and up north, the villages of Middlefield, Burton, Aquila, and also here, Manaway. Um, it's very rural, too, so this is what has really protected us. It covers 207 square miles. Um, the river itself is an estimated width of about 30 feet, so um, pretty good size for being a um, uh, the upper part of a river, but it has a really gentle gradient. So we don't have um, a huge fall of um, uh, topography in this uh, upper stretch. And um, we've got a nice steady source of water flowing. So um, that really helps with some of the navigation where we can boat on the upper Cuyahoga year round. Um, there are two distinct uh, sections still, even in this upper Cuyahoga a stretch. Um, above Hiram Rapids, the river had been channelized in the, um, excavated in the early 1900s, and it's a pretty straight channel in places. Um, it has uh, kind of swampy edges as well, and it's wild and woolly, protected by um, the University of Ak or Akron City Water um, has protected a lot of that land up in Geauga County, so it's been, but it's, it's swamps, and it's, you know, it's nice that they hadn't been drained and they've been preserved. Um, but as you get further down into Portage County and then the topography changes a little bit and so that the river changes as well. We've got um, more hills, uh, you know, the, these um, uh, glacial deposits along there. Um, uh, but this is a virtual wilderness um, in some of these stretches where you get on the river and you can't hear um, traffic um, and it's just wild and woolly and beautiful. So here's some old historic photos that I found um, of some of the more swampy areas um, up in Geauga County. So uh, this came out of the Cleveland Memory Project. If you want to look at a really bunch of neat old photos, um, that's a really great uh, arsenal of um, historic photos that have been gathered. Um, uh, it's uh, swampy backwaters, riparian habitat, wetlands. It's excellent habitat for beaver, muskrat, otter, great blue heron, um, uh, sand hill cranes, wood ducks, um, you know, plants like willows and sycamore, elms, box elders dominate uh, these swamp forests and the shoreline and the floodplain. Um, if you haven't put in an Eldon Russell, that's Geauga Park District's, whoops, uh, Geauga Park District's park um, that has a just redone, uh, revamped uh, boat launch too. Of course, uh, taking out is a little harder because um, uh, 422 bridge is under construction too. So I'm not sure what the end date of that is. Um, 
Uh, but that's a really neat stretch, even if you just pedal down to 422 and back up. Um, but that, that uh, 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 property went to the Geauga Park District in 1969, and um, it's it's nice. Uh, it's a nice chunk of property to explore. If you haven't been there, you should check it out. Um, so let's get back down into Portage County. So. Uh, you know, we cross Hiram Rapids, we go through those a uh, little bit of increased flow um, through the rapids and we've got more meanders, you know, a little bit more hilly um, slopes. Um, and then we have a, a smattering of really awesome uh, natural history features on the landscape, like the Manaway Swamp, which is a um, uh, national natural landmark. Um, I think I read somewhere it's the only one in um, Portage County. So that's a big general area um, that includes uh, Marsh Wetlands State Nature Preserve and Manaway Bog um, State Nature Preserve. In addition um, to uh, uh, these two that I just mentioned, um, Scenic Rivers actually hold some conservation easements um, in the same area as well. So when the um, bike trail, and I'm sorry, I can't think of the name, the, the bike trail that goes right by um, Manaway Bog, um, the north side. The Headwaters Trail. Yeah, thank you, the Headwaters, Headwaters. Trail. So Scenic Rivers property is on the north side of Manaway Bog as well. So um, we own some properties and then some private landowners. Um, uh, we have conservation easements on their properties around Goodall, so a little bit around the corner. Um, but it's a nice, big, intact um, wetland area. So pretty awesome for the river to have these wetlands to help um, you know, filter and uh, act like a sponge and um, slowly recharge um, the river to keep that constant flow. Um, just uh, south of, um, no, west, I should say, well, down river, I guess is what I should say, um, then is Tummins um, uh, State Nature Preserve. And this is unlike Manway Bog, where it's permit only to get into this, this very special wetland. Tummins um, uh, State Nature Preserve uh, is open access, but you pretty much have to get there by boat. So um, you'd have to go downriver and you are allowed to uh, disembark and explore that state nature um, preserve. Um, I'm not sure, and maybe we could chat about this um, at the end of the presentation as well, but um, Tummins um, State Nature Preserve is adjacent to some village of Manaway land. And um, this is a panoramic um, picture that um, the preserve manager, Adam Wolliver, uh, shared with me. And there's some current, um, you know, uh, this happens in this area. There's, there's some sand and gravel mines. So this area all over here is all proposed to be sand and gravel mines, which it comes out into these wetlands too, adjacent to the state nature preserve. So, you know, we're working on trying to mitigate disturbance to this wetland. Um, and I'm not sure if that has been public knowledge, but it's something that we're working on behind the scenes. If you really have any questions, Adam Wolliver is the person to go to, um, to talk about this. And that's right. You can, I think this photo vantage point is off the Esker trail. Um, if you have hiked that as well. I should say you should hike it now before <laughs> maybe it doesn't look like this anymore. So what else makes our scenic river so special? Um, well, we work with a lot of volunteers to keep our thumbs on and try to keep tabs on how the river is doing. And we could tell by macro invertebrates. This is a little stonefly. Um, this is a pretty special stonefly also. Um, uh, but these macroinvertebrates sometimes are very sensitive to any kind of changes in water quality. And they're relatively long lived, so they will live multiple years. So if something changes with the water, um, we can detect a presence absence or number um, changes. And uh, um, maybe that's the, the red flag that allows us to start looking for what's going on there. Um, these critters are small, they don't move very far, so they live in the riffle habitat. That's the habitat where the water's running over the rocks, it's highly oxygenated, they require cool water, so um, 
warm water usually loses its oxygen, but in those cool riffles, um, this is where we look for these critters. Some of them are super sensitive to a different kind of chemicals too, so chemical pollution. Um, of course, I talked about oxygen in the water and heat, so they cannot live in, in, in warm water. In fact, this little critter was in a um, little white tub, and if you've ever pulled macrovertebrates out of the water before, um, this particular one, stoneflies actually do um, push-ups when the water starts to get too warm and they're losing oxygen out of it that they can't obtain out of the water, and they need to be in running water also. But these little fluffy things under their armpits, under their legs, along the sides of their thorax are gills. So they'll actually physically do push-ups to move water across those gills so they can keep on um, pulling oxygen out of the water. So that's kind of sometimes a neat behavior to see. Um, and let, let's, you know, that they're stressed, they need to get back in that cold water. And because they breathe through gills, since a lot of these macroinvertebrates breathe through gills, some of them obtain oxygen out of the water different ways, but sediment soil in the water if it settles on them and coats those gills too, then that impairs their, their ability to um, pull oxygen out of the water. So um, we go out with volunteers, um, train volunteers to pull these out of the water. And I'll talk about stream quality monitoring a little bit more too, but this is just a really cool image that one of my colleagues from Central Ohio shared with me. There's so many cool critters in here. So these are Dobson flies. Here's a dragonfly nymph. This is some kind of um, dipterin uh, larva. I'm not sure which one this is. Uh, damselfly nymph. There's some aquatic isopods. Sorry, I just jumped ahead. Um, a couple fishes in here. Of course, crayfish here. Here's the fish over here. And I, there's a caddisfly there. And I thought there was a mayfly in this image too, but I'm not seeing it right now. So. We'll talk about some more of these aquatic macrovertebrates in a little bit. But uh, one of the neat things about the Upper Cuyahoga River is people like to fish here, and there's some really great fish. Um, uh, when the Scenic River designation studies were going on, um, they found uh, 31 fish species in the Upper Cuyahoga, and we're at 50 plus now. So we know when we protect the river, you know, fish populations can rebound. And if fish populations are rebounding, we know all levels of this uh, food chain, food web are getting reconnected as well. So uh, things like this yellow perch in the middle, um, you know, weren't quite so common um, years ago. And some of the other fishes people like to fish. Of course, these are all my educational photos. I don't have any fishermen photos on the Cuyahoga River yet, but I know people pull out um, smallmouth bass and, um, Northern pike as well, pretty popular ones. So this was a school field trip that we did this um, fall. Uh, uh, we, we caught 13 um, species of fish by seining right at Beechert Park, um, which was fun. Uh, this is some kind of little catfish. Um, and there are some more rare fishes in um, uh, the Upper Cuyahoga as well. We didn't catch any super rare ones um, here at this location, but uh, out of those 50, it's nice to know that, the, that you know, there's some recovery and some um, more sensitive ones. Here's a channel cat. I love this front view with their lips in their barbels. Um, this is a black-sided darter. Um, you know, darters are um, uh, hug the bottom and they're in the riffles and they're predators. So they hunt and eat those macroinvertebrates. Um, and this is our group of kids, uh, students. Fish saning. We did a regular stream quality monitoring where we pulled out macrovertebrates, and then after lunch, we got to fish sane with them um, or sane fish. Here's a yellow bullhead. Again, I love that cute little catfish face. Um, grass pickerel, which is like the mini me of the northern pike, and golden shiner, um, which is a pretty high quality fish, um, you know, for being a minnow. Uh, their habitat is slow moving streams and they can even survive in oxbows and wetlands. Um, but that's a good one that has shown back up in good numbers in um, uh, the upper Cuyahoga as well. So I know a couple of you that are out there in the audience, at least if you guys did really tune in tonight. Um, I'm a birder on the side as well. I, um, uh, the local Audubon group up 
in Lake Tioga and Ashtabula County. I've been on the board a couple of year, for a couple of years now and um, do birding a lot in my uh, spare time. So I am thrilled to get out here on the Upper Cuyahoga and find some of these birds as well. So um, we got a black-throated green on the left. Bald eagles are really starting to reestablish and that's one of those critters that um, was really impacted by DDT and chemicals and um, frankly, uh, not clean water that couldn't support the fish that they were requiring to eat. Um, so nice that habitat was preserved, water got cleaned up, and uh, no more DDT. So their numbers are certainly rebounding. And we're so lucky to have sandhill cranes rebounding as well. Um, if you've ever heard sandhill cranes, they're fantastic um, to hear their, their calls in the spring. Some of the other cool birds of the Upper Cuyahoga that I've got to run into. Um, common yellowthroat are... Um, kind of that wetlands, um, edges of rivers, wetlands, marshes. Um, this male has that black face and that yellow um, throat. And if you don't see them, especially once the leaves come out, you probably have heard them call. They say, witchity, witchity, witchity. And you know, you hear them um, all spring. Uh, wood ducks have really um, risen in numbers too. And they are a very, um, iconic uh, wetland bird too, but they really require um, big trees along, uh, you know, like bottomland forests and swamps and marshes and beaver ponds. Um, we need trees for them because they are cavity nesters. So I love this image of them perched up in this cottonwood. They're the only waterfowl that has um, gripping feet that they actually can perch in a tree like, uh, like a songbird does. Um, that's always neat but having a cavity nesting um, duck is pretty neat to see. So even better to have um, a buddy to take a really fantastic photo and allow me to use it for education to watch them up in the, in the tree. Um, uh, I have seen wood ducks already in uh, January and it's not that they went away. As long as there's food, they're gonna stay around and they um, eat a lot of seeds. So having intact bottomland swamp forests with button bushes and acorns um, and other seeds is important for them for their survival over the winter. And um, osprey, I know um, people get really excited about osprey's recovery as well. And you guys have had osprey reestablished a little bit longer than we have up on the lake um, where they are nesting on cell phone towers and fishing at some of these um, lakes and reservoirs. Um, but so fun to watch them um, plunge feet first into the water to catch a fish. And again, just like bald eagles, their numbers went, were really low because of DDT and um, frankly, the poor water quality and fishes couldn't survive here. So um, really nice to have um, their recovery as well and catch a glimpse of them. This next slide I have is Prothonotary warbler. Uh, Prothonotary warbler is uh, one of those special birds that means swamp. Um, they are a flash of light kind of in the dim uh, recesses of the swamp forests along the Cuyahoga River. And um, if you haven't heard one, uh, they have a really uh, ringing song in the springtime. So if you put in an Eldon Russell, you're certainly um, uh, would expect to hear them if not see them. Flashes of yellow through um, the wetlands. Um, but really the loss of forested wetlands um, has caused their numbers to decline. Um, if you haven't had a chance to hear Dan Best, the retired uh, chief naturalist from Geauga Park District, um, talk about his long-term, he just finished 30 years of prothonotary nest box monitoring at um, Elgin Russell, and he has helped boost that population big time. So um, look for his little nest boxes along Elgin Russell, along the river there. Um, and we're happy to have these birds come back. So we're gonna dive into some of these other treasures. <clears throat> And I got to cruise through the plant so I could talk about insects because that's really a big um, love of mine. So uh, we've got a really great riparian trees and I can't even begin to list them all. You know, I said a little bit of them a couple slides ago, um, but some of my favorites um, I've included on this slide. So black gum, a great pollinator plant. It's a summer bloomer, has a really great uh, blue black fruit that feeds uh, robins and you know sometimes they persist on the trees until about now so I'm sure they're all gobbled up by now um, but 
uh, into the early winter, they they have persisting fruit. Uh, yellow birch, also another great food source for birds that are overwintering here. Um, and uh, who doesn't love that iconic um, uh, uh, horizontal, um, you know, sh shredding bark with that coppery gold color? And um, you know, for the same reason, I like sycamore because it has just that striking bark and big canopy. When you want to get in the shade along a river, um, it sure is nice to find a sycamore to hunker under. Um, we'll move into some of the shrubs, the special swamp forest shrubs um, along the Cuyahoga River. Of course, um, uh, I might start including insects in all my pictures too. Uh, Buttonbush on the left uh, has a uh, Bombus bimaculatus uh, two-spotted bumblebee nectaring on it. And um, buttonbush are pretty neat. They are a pretty large shrub. They could grow with the roots in the water, but they can also grow up in, in dry areas. I would say plant buttonbush. Um, it supports about um, 12 Lepidopteran species also as, um, uh, is it 12? No, I don't have my notes in front of me. Um, definitely uh, have Lepidopteran caterpillars, whether they're moths or butterflies that um, require buttonbush too as part of their life cycle. So it's not just having pollinators um, benefit from this flower. Um, and I already mentioned wood ducks eat the seeds over the winter time as well. Um, in the middle, uh, willow blooms. So willow blooms, uh, willows bloom so early in the springtime. We've got specialist bees that require this. And um, uh, I love willows. They're one of those great biodiverse um, uh, plants that everybody should have in their backyard as well. Um, and, you know, this, I titled this as a swamp rose. It's actually a Virginia rose that I just mislabeled and I forgot to correct. Um, swamp rose usually has a little bit lighter pink um, flower, not quite so vibrant, but uh, swamp rose is one of these other great bottom land um, uh, shrubs. It will also do very well in dry land too, so you could plant that in your yard. Um, multiple benefits, smells great, and supports um, so many insects. And actually rose hips for the birds over the winter time as well. Uh, let's dive into um, some of our herbaceous plants. So we've got some real treasures, uh, you know, pretty common to swamps around everywhere and river edges. Um, marsh violets on the left, in the center. Uh, whoops, <laughs> that's not a great blue lobelia. Uh, marsh marigold, sorry about that. Um, and uh, skunk cabbage on the right and I took that skunk cabbage pick um, just a couple weeks ago when things were freezing up but we really didn't have that much snow on the ground so these are the beginnings of um, the early early our first wildflowers that will bloom and uh, they support some early season pollinators usually flies but I've heard of bees hunkering down inside of the um, that cup that hood of spathe of the skunk cabbage too because it's warmer in there than it is out in the cold air Here's my great blue lobelia. Um, here's some other great wetland-ish uh, water's edge plants. Um, swamp blue strife on the left. That's a beautiful arching um, uh, form of a, a wetland plant. And this is a uh, golden northern bumblebee, Bombus uh, fervidus, nectaring off of that. And that's a um, declining bumblebee too. So it's really nice to have a um, plants to support them. Um, in the center, we've got, gosh, one of the little skippers, and I don't know which one that is, um, Pex maybe, um, on great blue lobelia. And I have about a million pictures of great blue lobelia with green sweat bees, bumblebees. Um, it's interesting because a butterfly or the skipper can stick his proboscis down in that tube of that purple flower. You, you can kind of see that proboscis scooped down in there. Um, but some of my pictures, the bees back out of their bumbles, especially just covered in pollen and um, uh, great uh, pollinator plant and grows right at the edges of wetlands. And um, here's another lobelia. It's lobelia cardinalis, um, cardinal flower. Um, great nectar plant for lots of other critters. And it also attracts hummingbirds too. So that's a great one to add um, or a great one to look for as you're out on the river, um, maybe paddling this next season. And maybe you'll be out paddling with us next season. So I mentioned that I like insects. So 
I reared Cecropia moth caterpillars a couple of years ago, and um, I ended up rearing 12 different Lepidopteran species accidentally. So here's my big, um, you know, at its end, it was like a small hot dog um, uh, eating willows. And I was rearing them because I try to advocate, make that animal plant connection. We need a native plants if we want to support biodiversity because they're the base of the food chain um, that cascades up. Um, this little critter here, when I first collected this willow, do you guys see that? Little yellow stripes on this caterpillar that match this midrib vein of the willow there. Amazingly, um, uh, great camouflage. And when I was snipping these branches to bring them inside to rear my cecropia that were captive reared, um, so I could use them for interpretation, I started to find caterpillars that I didn't know what they were. So this one, um, I did not identify the caterpillar, I identified the moth after it emerged from its cocoon and it was a quick one. Um, and then I went back and matched photos and sure, look, this is a herald caterpillar and look at this great uh, camouflage. And um, this one is not quite so camouflaged, but it's a bird poop mimic. This is a viceroy caterpillar too. So let's look at the adults of all of those. Here's a Cecropia on the left, there's the herald, and that's my thumb when I was releasing it. So, you know, it's not a very big um, uh, moth at all, but it's one of my favorites. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And if you don't know the etymology behind what a herald is, um, you know, it's a, uh, 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 I've just lost the word. Um, you know, it's in the royal um, family, and, but they have these beautiful flowing robes when they all get dressed in their royal best. So look at this beautiful robe of this herald, beautiful. And then um, uh, that viceroy caterpillar that I showed you that was the bird poop mimic. This is the adult viceroy that um, mimic of, maybe a mimic of um, monarch butterflies, but in its own right, their caterpillars grow up eating willows, which has uh, salicylic acid in, which doesn't taste good for a predator to eat it. So, you know, maybe it isn't a direct mimic of monarch so much as it's advertising, hey, I taste bad. And, you know, two for one, they both taste bad. If you're a predator, you wouldn't want to eat either one of them. So let's talk about some of these aquatic macroinvertebrates. Uh, damsel flying nymphs are um, these long kind of frail, uh, sprawly legs. They're insects, six legs and they have three um, uh, lamella like gills that hang off their rear end that they can flap and move through the water or water passes through them and they absorb oxygen out of it. And, and of course, here's the adult damsel. And here's another species of damsel different than that first one I showed you, but here's a, a dragon fly nymph and an adult dragon fly and um, one of my volunteers, and I hope he's on tonight too. Hi, Joe, if you're out there. Uh, he was stream quality monitoring for me and we were doing a training uh, at, uh, I think it was the beginning of June. And we got to watch, it's hard to see in this image. And in retrospect, I kick myself that I didn't get better images. I just need to go back in early June because they have mass emergence. This is the um, larva that or the shell of the larva crawled up on the bank out of the Cuyahoga River and um, uh, the adult was emerging, you know, the back splits open. So here's that exuvia, that's that dried um, shell of what used to be that aquatic macroinvertebrate nymph. And uh, these strings help, um, the, uh, help function to inflate certain parts of the body as it is emerging. Um, but look at this little potato chip like, uh, dragon fly nymph. Um, that was a really fun experience and I can't wait to learn more of these as I'm out on the river as well. Um, here's that same image of the uh, stonefly larva I showed you before and here's an adult stonefly. Sometimes, you know, a lot of times we see the terrestrial insects because we walk on land, we see these insects. This particular one came to a moth light, was attracted to a light at night, um, but sometimes we don't connect this larval form with the adult form. Um, so I want to work on that as well. Uh, I actually get to work on a state fair exhibit that we're going to have a, a hands-on activity where you look at the uh, larval form and then the adult form. Um, in this little container, we've got a couple stoneflies off the edge, but here's the mayflies, two different kinds of mayflies, flat-headed mayfly, squished flat, sticks to rocks and high current, and then this um, 
uh, brush-legged um, uh, mayfly here too. They're characterized, it's harder to tell here, one, two, three uh, Circe tail-like appendages off of their uh, rear end. That's one of the easy ways to, whoa, um, <clears throat> find them. And then, oops, my adult um, mayfly didn't make it into my presentation. Sorry about that. Uh, Anybody fish using helgramite um, bait? So um, helgramites are either Dobson fly larva. Um, somewhat similar is our fish flies um, larva. So they're big predators. They've got these um, lateral um, projections coming off their abdomen. Of course, they're insects. So one, two, three, four, five, six legs are up here coming off their thorax. And these are just, I don't know, maybe to make them scarier and bigger, has no function, doesn't help them absorb oxygen or anything, but these guys are voracious predators. So here's all their mouth parts off the front and they definitely pinch. Um, when I took a aquatic insects class in college, um, I quickly found out when I collected one and was working on the ID that, that um, the local folks called them um, toe biters. So maybe you've heard that as well. I guess great fish bait, but to have great fish, you need to have great insects in the water to feed them. But here's this adult um, fish fly. And, and they're rather large. I mean, the um, larval form and then the adult are very striking and large. This is a cool one that um, <clears throat> I had known a little bit about. Uh, they, there are moth larvae that live underwater. So they have adaptations to get oxygen out of the water and they pupate under the water. So they actually just form their cocoon under the water. And um, uh, all of these little things are all around their bodies. They're just not lateral projections that go off the side. And so looking at them under the scope, they just look like, like, what is this? I have no idea what this little critter is. Again, um, they're insects. So they just have six legs up here on their thorax and then down the rest of their um, abdomen. They actually have pro legs, just like our caterpillars that are moth and um, uh, uh, butterfly caterpillars. And, you know, with hooks to help them hold on to things. And this is on a water willow. Oh, sorry. Uh, water willow along um, uh, one of the rivers I'm monitoring. And um, I was pretty excited and um, there's aquatic moths and look, the adults are on the water, water perched on the water willow right adjacent to the river. So um, that's been fun. And I think that um, Joe has been finding um, those at his uh, moth lights at his house too. And I hope you guys all got to see Joe's presentation on moths last week also. Uh, so there's a lot of really cool um, critters we could say along the way. So let's jump into paddling. Um, if you haven't seen this um, Rivers edition, um, I've got copies of these. Jen, I don't know if you have any of these to hand out, um, but this is a sample page. I did the Tumman State Nature Preserve, so you could see um, how the river uh, goes through here. It's just a little bit west of 44, um, uh, but that's how the, the page setup is. And uh, it says it's scenic river and it's a good place for birds, but they will identify if it's a place that you um, have any other amenities you could um, have restrooms or boat launch or boat takeout. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Scenic Rivers does um, uh, paddling floats as well. So uh, we've got a couple that are, we're in the planning stages. One of them we will be um, going have events posted on there. Um, but we also will be doing a paddling program at Eldon Russell this summer too, uh, looking for birds and, and other summer wildlife. Um, so uh, these are free of charge and we have um, the watercraft and or we could um, have you come along if you have your own boat as well. But you guys, um, since you guys are Porter's Park District fans, you probably already all know about the Red Fox um, wanted to say that we've got a thriving um, uh, paddling um, livery um, operations in our area too. So it's really fun to have folks learn about our great um, resource here in Portage County um, and in Geauga County as well. Uh, 
so we do all kinds of paddling um, and I can't wait to get out and explore the rivers uh, a little bit more. But if you haven't known, uh, well, so when we split Northeastern Ohio in half, this is my um, uh, supervisor, Jeffrey Hayes. He is the uh, Scenic Rivers Manager. Um, and so this is the two of us on an exploratory float. And we did some fish um, working with Brian Zimmerman. And then um, thanks to Portage Park District for sharing some of their photos as well. Um, but definitely the Upper Cuyahoga is a recreational treasure. Whether you're paddling or you are um, out there in your boat, I, I saw a lot of um, fishing vessels this summer as well. And I should have just asked them if I could have taken their pictures. So if you wanna get involved with scenic rivers to help um, protect, keep our Upper Cuyahoga River as awesome as it can be, or even more awesome, um, there's a bunch of different ways that you can get involved with us. You can stream quality monitor, we call that SQM. Um, if you know anybody who are teachers, we do uh, free school field trips, which pretty much we go through our stream quality monitoring program with the students and pull those macrovertebrates out, ID them, talk about um, how they're pretty much canaries in the coal mine. They could tell us what's going on um, in the water. Uh, we do sometimes private floats and sometimes uh, for the public floats, we do interpretive hikes. Um, <clears throat> I don't have any down this way, but I think I'm doing a spring wildflower walk on Ashtabula River and um, probably a birding program and an invasive species hike um, up on County Hunt. Uh, we could use help, um, you know, so you could come along on those or you could help lead these with us or find new places to go explore, help us table at events. And um, we need to tackle invasive plants and have stewardship work days, just like the park district does because these um, native uh, thug-like plants take over our riparian areas. And um, uh, we have that property along the Headwaters Trail. Um, and then we have one a little bit further down river um, behind the Dollar General in Manaway also is one of our properties. So we're working on invasive species removals there. We also have a property on Coit Road um, right on the river um, that we've been working on some invasive species. So we'd love to have your help. Uh, sometimes you just get out there and find lots of really cool things while you're out there uh, yanking plants out of the ground. <clears throat> so this is really, I mean, I get to interpret the, the Cuyahoga River for all of its great qualities, but this is kind of the meat and bones of what I do is overseeing the stream quality monitoring program. So I oversee the volunteers that that um, help us with this, where we actually monitor the stream health by pulling these aquatic benthic macroinvertebrates out of the water. So um, that's a pretty mouthful of words, aquatic benthic macroinvertebrates. It means, um, you know, aquatic, they're in the water. Water Benthic means the bottom of the stream. So they're the ones that are actually not floating around the water column. They're not up top like um, water striders or really gig beetles. Um, they are macro, so they're big enough to see. We don't need to look under a microscope per se on these ones. So a lot of times we could identify them with our bare eyes or maybe with cheater glasses. Um, and they're invertebrates, so they don't have a backbone. So aquatic, aquatic <laughs> benthic macroinvertebrates. Um, but having this core of volunteers that help us um, watch short-term water quality trends so we could see differences um, over um, a year or from one monitoring session to another, or even long-term trends as well. And um, our volunteer program, pretty much the way it runs is we have volunteers that adopt a site and then commit to putting nets in the water three times a year. So in the spring, it's May, June, summer is July, August, and fall is September, October. And, and um, uh, fill out data sheets and hand those in and um, uh, help us keep tabs on the river. So. These are some pictures of some stream quality monitoring um, volunteers. Uh, this is a kick sand. I guess neither of these pictures really show um, them kicking, but uh, this family group here has just pulled um, their sand up. And then what you do is you come to the riverbank and start picking through critters using some of the um, guides we have to fill out the data sheets. And the data sheet is on the left and the sample one, um, pretty simple to use. We take, um, uh, uh, some other recordings, we 
um, try to assess how much sediment is in the water column as well. So that's what the total suspended solids are and a little description of how it looks today when you're doing the monitoring. Um, and then we start diving into these critters and assessing, you know, putting these letter codes. If we see one to nine of the critters, we fill this column out with an A. We do this three times and we have all these little cheat sheet um, ID sheets to help you and do trainings. I'm doing a couple Zoom trainings and uh, some refresher courses with our volunteers in the spring too. So uh, it is so fun. You never know what you're going to pull out of the water and um, always need to get in the river and see what's going on. So I'd love to have you guys join us and uh, maybe working with Jen um, this summer to get some of her stream quality monitoring sites going, um, you know, outside of the river itself. So I just want to share some of these other treasures. Um, oh my gosh, I still didn't even change this title here either, but uh, here's a green darner. Just fun when you get out there to explore, to see the things that you see because you're outside doing stream quality monitoring and then you stumble into these other things. Um, uh, common Eastern bumblebee on a, a pickerel weed and then spring peepers. Uh, we're going to be doing some amphibian monitoring on our properties as well. Um, so I swiped this um, quote at the top from, I think it was from Cuyahoga River Wrap, um, but I loved it. It says, conservation is about more than protecting other species from humans. It's about protecting these relationships um, among these species, between these species and habitats, and be between humans and other species. So uh, it's always fun to pull critters out and show them to kid kids and make those connections. Um, but I think that you need to do that education. You need to have those connections. So this EO, this clip of an EO Wilson quote at the bottom too is um, something that's near and dear to me. I love to talk about biodiversity, how we need to have all these chinks in the ecosystem that help um, keep everything intact and work in ways that we can't even imagine. But um, without education, uh, you can't sell the idea of protecting places like the Upper Cuyahoga River. So every scrap of biodiversity is priceless to be learned and cherished.